Hello, everybody. I always have to start with a statement of disclosure, which is all of our original work was funded by the FDA, and our institution has only had research support to help execute regulatory requests, and I have never had any personal compensation at any time. Oh, sorry, I went the wrong way. So, we're here to discuss administration of this scale, but I always like to start with a few minutes on the public health story behind its use and, and why it's actually a good thing that we're doing it. And that all begins with the fact that the field of medicine and even psychiatry has been challenged by a lack of clarity as to how to define even the most basic suicidal occurrences. And corresponding to that, we've had no well-defined terminology, which has very much cut across research and clinical settings. So what happens is the same occurrence gets called 12 different things. Suicide attempt, not a suicide attempt, threat, gesture. And often the labels are negative, like manipulative, non-serious but based on incorrect notions as to the relationship between seriousness and lethality. So somebody hears, oh, she only took three pills, we can't call that suicidal, when the data actually tells us something else. This will clearly have negative implications on how we manage. If we can't properly identify ideation and behavior, we certainly can't understand, manage, or treat it, no matter where we're trying to do so. Now this problem has had profound impact on our drug safety data sets, beginning with the antidepressants, but it even limits our confidence in epidemiological statistics, because if everybody's defining things differently, how can we compare across settings? So the good news is now the Columbia definitions are the CDC surveillance definitions, but this problem has really had its tentacles in lots of places. What happens is we can't interpret the meaning of suicidal occurrences and it hampers precise communication on an individual or a population basis. So things that should be called suicidal are missed and things are inappropriately called suicidal. In clinical trials, we can't interpret the meaning of anything either. Adverse events that should be called suicidal are missed and things are inappropriately called suicidal. This is a quote from Alex Crosby from CDC. It's actually referencing the Institute of Medicine who highlights this problem as one of the major impediments to suicide prevention. Now, these are examples of the problem that I'm talking about, and they come from the various RCTs, randomized controlled trials, that went into our FDA safety findings. And they just reflect what goes on in clinical practice uh, uh, across the world. So the first one says, 10-year-old male exhibited symptoms of personality disorder. I always say, don't get me started with calling a 10-year-old personality disorder, but that's a conversation for another day. Patient attempted to hang himself with a rope. Investigator did not consider this a serious adverse event, but rather part of the personality disorder. So you see nowhere was suicidality indicated in the label. The overdose of six capsules was in fact intentional, yet called accidental overdose. We call this one the slap heard round the world because it's been written a lot about. In fact, this scale was on the front page of the New York Times about a year and a half ago because suicide assessment has become such a big issue. And this example was in there because it really tells the story. Somebody somewhere called a slap in the face a suicide attempt. Now, clearly a slap in the face shouldn't be called a suicide attempt. But what it shows you is that it's not about drug companies or investigators covering things up, because it shouldn't be called that. It's about the fact that there hasn't been training or standardization in the field and how to do this. Here's one in the other direction. Patient experienced eventration after a laparotomy due to an abdominal wound caused by a self-inflicted gunshot, yet only called abdominal hernia. That's one of my new favorites. And here's, a, however, a schizophrenic on the bottom, hit his head on the wall. Patient explained it was like his thoughts were about to explode. And that one was probably inappropriately called suicide attempt. So it goes, in, it goes in all directions. My final example would be funny if it weren't tragic. 
the patient involved in the federal witness protection program. I always say I'm not sure how you get in a drug company trial when you're in the federal witness protection program, but this is in fact a true case for having testified against mobsters died by apparent suicide. He called the lawyer, not the doctor, and said, please help, I'm going to die, and showed up dead by something they labeled as suicide. Anyway, reason to question labels. That's the problem. What happens when we start to do something about it? Well, when we first applied a standardized approach, beginning with the antidepressants, it led to a 50% reduction in suicide attempts, a 50% reduction in the harm ratio, which shows you why we needed to do better. And that's consistent with findings that misclassification actually can lead to overestimation of true risk in this context. But even that's not enough. And what I mean by that is that all of prior research and clinical practice has not been set up to assess for suicidality, okay? It hasn't been set up to answer the questions that we need answered. So let me start with, with the FDA work. You know how we have warning labels on antidepressants, et cetera? All of that data, we were making the best sense of limited data. We had to rely on what we call spontaneously generated adverse events. The problem with doing that is that People on active medication have more side effects, right? Headache, stomach ache, wh whatever it may be. It may just be that an investigator had more contact with a patient because they had more side effects and thus more time to hear about suicidality, as opposed to it being a true difference in risk. So all of these um, safety analyses may really just be about the, the safety findings may just be about the limitations of the data. And in fact, with the antidepressants, FDA had item data, systematic data. It did not confirm the risk we saw with adverse events. And we had to have 20 subsequent analyses that show the same thing. When you systematically monitor, you don't see the risk you see with adverse events. So the first thing we're doing with better, more systematic assessment is avoiding false or misleading results. Now, this scale was actually originally designed in, in the context of an NIMH trial, the first treatment of adolescent suicide attempters study, a multi-site national trial where we had all these different measures and we realized there was a need for something to, to, to look at severity. It is the prospective counterpart of the system we developed for the FDA, which is why FDA and other regulators are often asking for its use whenever we have the luxury of collecting new data. It was developed by a number of the leading experts. It's actually a collaboration with Beck's group. Many of you are familiar with the Beck depression rating scales or suicide scales. It's very, it's low burden with a very short administration time, but it uniquely assesses both behavior and ideation. So even when we do a large suicide study and we can take as much time as we want, we have to do one measure of behavior, one of ideation. Nothing had really put them together. So although it's low burden, we actually think it's a comprehensive measure that includes only the most necessary characteristics one would want to track in any setting. It's simply a one to five rating for suicidal ideation from a wish to die through an active thought of killing oneself with plan and intent. It can be as little as two questions for ideation. So you say, have you wished you were dead or wished you could go to sleep and not wake up? or have you actually had any thoughts of killing yourself? If the answer is no to both of those questions, there is no suicidal ideation, so you move on to behavior. For behavior, we cover the spectrum. It fixes the problems we've seen in the past. It gives you the definitions. It gives you the questions to ask to figure out what to call something. It's the only scale that we're aware of that has definitions. We talked about the importance of definitions, and it has standardized questions for each category, which helps you facilitate improved identification. It's what we call semi-structured. That means it's a flexible format. The questions are provided as helpful tools. It's not required to ask any or all of them, just enough to get the right answer. That's the most important thing, for you to gather enough information to decide if you should call something suicidal or not. So for example, if you say, have you made a suicide attempt, and the patient says, yes, I took 50 pills because I definitely wanted to die, you'll see in a few moments that you'll have enough information to call that a suicide attempt, 
and there's no need to ask additional unnecessary questions. Sources of information. Well, with questionnaires like this, you're encouraged to use any and all sources of information that inform your best answer. Typically, the subject gives you the best insight into their suicidal feelings, but that's not always the case. Let's say a spouse of your patient calls you up and tells you about their husband or wife, your patient who's in the hospital, and this is what they wrote in the suicide note. You will have enough information according to the spouse report or the other source of information to check off attempt on your form, and you don't necessarily need to speak to the subject directly or a spouse sitting in the ER with you giving you, giving you information. Okay, this is the range of types of ideation, and what this is doing is articulating what we've been trained in psychiatry to do for many years. It just hasn't been necessarily clearly spelled out like this. Again, beginning with a wish to die, have you wished you were dead or wished you could go to sleep and not wake up? Or have you actually had any thoughts of killing yourself? If it's no to both of those, there is no ideation, you move on to behavior. However, if it's yes to the second question, have you actually had any thoughts of killing yourself? Then you ask three, four, and five. Have you been thinking about how you might do this? Have you had these thoughts and had some intention of acting on them? Or have you started to work out or worked out the details of how to kill yourself? You can't have methods, intent, or plan if you don't have a thought of killing yourself. There are subcategories of it. So that's why you only ask those questions if two is yes. Now, once you determine if there is any thought, you ask a few follow-up questions only about the most severe thought. Those include frequency, duration, control, deterrence, and reasons for ideation. The reason those are there is because Beck's group went through the scale of suicidal ideation with us, and those were the items that were significantly predictive of completed suicide. The minimum amount of information we think you'd want in, in most settings. So if there is a thought about the most severe, you say, how many times have you had these thoughts? When you have the thoughts, how long do they last? Can you stop thinking about killing yourself or wanting to die if you want to? Are there things, anyone or anything, like family, religion, pain of death, that stopped you from wanting to die or acting on thoughts of committing suicide? And finally, what sorts of reasons did you have for thinking about wanting to die or killing yourself? Was it to end the pain or stop the way you were feeling? In other words, you couldn't go on living with this pain or how you were feeling, or was it to get attention, revenge, or a reaction from others, or both? And we know if somebody says it was to stop or end the pain, that's when we worry more. So if they have more frequency, longer duration, less control, fewer deterrence, and it's to stop or end the pain, that's more, ser uh, more serious type of ideation, and that informs your clinical judgment. The other important thing that informs your clinical judgment or management is when do we go to the next step? Our guidance is when they have a four or five, okay? Now, for example, in, in non-psychiatry settings, in non-psychiatry trials, in obesity trials, there's a, an FDA guidance that says only when they have a four or five is what triggers referral to a mental health professional. See, before, people didn't necessarily know how to manage the information they were getting. So they'd, they'd hear about a wish to die, and they'd unnecessarily exclude from a study or walk to an ER. And that's not good for anybody. So what we think this is really doing is reducing unnecessary burden and unnecessary referrals. So that's our guidance that informs your, your, your clinical judgment. OK, we are moving on to behavior. And the whole behavior section is driven by this definition of attempt, which is really supported by 75 national trials and, and pretty much agreed upon by suicidologists across the world. And the definition is a self-injurious act committed with at least some intent to die as a result of the act. First of all, it says self-injurious act. It doesn't say self-injury. There does not have to be any injury or harm, just the potential for it. So if a man puts a gun in his mouth and he pulls the trigger, 
and luckily the gun failed to fire, even though he wasn't hurt, as soon as he pulled that trigger, it became a suicide attempt. There does not have to be physical injury. Then it says with at least some intent to die. This is really important. When people are feeling suicidal, they often have mixed motives. It just has to be that any part of them was doing this to end their life for us to call it suicidal. So if 5% of them wanted to die and 95% wanted to make their boyfriend angry, we call it a suicide attempt. It used to be that somebody would say, did you want to kill yourself? And the answer would be no, and they'd move on. Very often with the next question, did any part of you want to kill yourself? You can get a very different answer. Then it says, as a result of the act. That means the behavior and the intent must be linked. It must be the why, at least in part. You know, sometimes people cut because they're self-mutilating and they just want to feel better, and they always have a background suicidal thought. Those two things don't equal a suicide attempt. It, it must be the why, at least in part. And finally, we can infer intent clinically from behavior or circumstance. One way we can do that is if they thought it could be lethal. We can infer if they thought it could have killed them. Or what we call clinically impressive circumstances. That's a highly lethal act where no other intent but suicide can be inferred, like trying to shoot oneself in the head, or jumping from an eighth story, or taking 200 pills, or setting yourself on fire. No matter what they say, you can't infer anything but that. The other important thing to note about what we call suicide attempts is that as soon as the first pill is swallowed, or the first scratch with a knife is made, even if they change their mind five seconds later, and you know logically it couldn't have hurt them yet, it doesn't matter. As soon as that first pill is swallowed or that scratch is made, it's what we call a suicide attempt. Now remember I said you don't have to ask any or all questions, just what you need. It may be that a patient doesn't recognize to themselves that something should be called a suicide attempt. So it may take you the second question. Have you done anything to harm yourself? for you to even know that you have something to assess. Now this is the CDC definition. As I said, it's, 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 it is the Columbia definition, which is really you know, a nice thing for uniformity. And what we're doing is distinguishing suicide attempts from non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. That's when somebody engages in the behavior purely 100% for reasons other than to end one's life. What we think of as self-mutilation, that's to feel better, relieve internal pain, or what we call affecting external circumstance. That's like if a man goes up to the roof because he believes people will feel sorry for him if they think he's suicidal. He actually has no intention of ending his life. He just wants to get sympathy from others. If that man accidentally fell to his death, theoretically, that's just what we would call it an accidental death because there was no suicidal intent associated with it. Okay, we're going to go through these example cases from our hospital together. The first one says, the patient wanted to escape from her mother's home. She, wanted, she researched lethal doses of ibuprofen, and you don't have those in front of you, those are for later. <laughs> she researched lethal doses of ibuprofen. She took six ibuprofen pills and said she felt certain from her research that this amount was not enough to kill her. She stated she did not want to die, only to escape from her mother's home. She was taken to the ER where her stomach was pumped and she was admitted to a psychiatric ward. Do you think that's a suicide attempt, anybody? No, exactly right. And there, there are a few important things to note about this case. All over this girl's record, it said suicide attempt. It wasn't until somebody took the time to ask the question why, simple question, why did you do it? that we got better, more reliable information. And we think that will always be the case. The other thing is, she also had suicide attempts. And she was very able to say, on these occasions I wanted to kill myself, but here I definitely didn't. And the point is, you have to assess each occurrence independently. Don't assume because one thing was suicidal that the next thing will be, because they come together in the same patients. And it's very important for your outcomes or your risk assessment to know the difference between four suicide attempts and one suicide attempt. Young woman following a fight with her boyfriend felt like she wanted to die, impulsively took a kitchen knife and made a superficial scratch to her wrist. 
Before she actually punctured the skin or bled, however, she changed her mind and stopped. Attempt? Exactly, yes. Patient was feeling ignored. She went into the family kitchen where her mother and sister were talking. She took a knife out of the drawer and made a cut on her arm. She denied she wanted to die at all, not even a little, but just wanted them to pay attention to her. Right, no. Patient cut her wrists after an argument with her boyfriend. Any thoughts? Not enough information. We know what she did, we just don't know why she did it. And both suicidal behavior and self-mutilation have stressors that precipitate them, so argument with boyfriend doesn't tell you anything. We just know what she did. Had a big fight with her ex-husband, took 15 to 20 amipramine, drank charcoal, admitted to the hospital, unable to verbalize clear intent, but state she was well aware of the dangers of TCA overdose and the potential for death. Yes, that's an attempt. Remember, you can infer it if they thought it could be lethal, so exactly. Okay, now there's some other suicidal behaviors that are also important to assess. They just don't reach the threshold of an attempt. And the first one is called an interrupted attempt. That's when a person starts to take steps to end their life, but someone or something stops them. So they're on the ledge poised to jump, somebody grabs them back. She has a gun in her hand, somebody grabs it out of her hand. An aborted attempt is exactly the same thing, but they stop themselves. So he goes up to the roof, he turns around and changes his mind. She has a gun in her hand, she puts it down. He plans to drive his car off the road at high speed. On the way, he turns around and changes his mind. And the final category is any other behavior. A verbalization is not a behavior, by the way. Saying something is not a behavior, but any other behavior with suicidal intent collecting or buying pills, purchasing a gun, writing a will or suicide note. So the question is, have you taken any steps towards making a suicide attempt or preparing to kill yourself, such as collecting pills, getting a gun, giving valuables away, or writing a suicide note? So the very examples are in the question for you to ask the patient. Now, for behavior, it's important to indicate everything that's appropriate. But you only want to select something if it's a discrete behavior. So if somebody wrote a suicide note as part of an actual attempt, you wouldn't check off preparatory behavior and actual attempt because it was part of the actual attempt and you don't want to overcount things. Now, this is the attempt section and I just want to highlight two things. This is the only place with multiple questions. And remember I said you don't have to ask any or all questions, just what you need. Look at that last indented question. Or did you think it was possible you could have died from? Remember the definition, you can infer it if they thought it could have killed them, So you, if they deny intent. So you may need that question. It just gives you the tools you may need to come up with the right answer. And then on the bottom it says, has subject engaged in non-suicidal self-injurious behavior? We think that's important because what that does is give you credit for having appropriately assessed something and ruling it out. If that weren't there for the self-mutilation cases or the things you don't call suicidal, it just would be nose down the entire page. It wouldn't be reflected that you asked the right questions and you decided that something shouldn't be called suicidal. Lethality. We answer a lethality question for actual suicide attempts only. And if there is medical damage, we answer it in terms of what actually happened in terms of medical damage. Not what could have happened or should have happened, but what actually happened. This is the item. This is a compilation of the Beck Medical Lethality Rating Scale. It's a zero through five. Zero is no physical damage or very minor physical damage, e.g. surface scratches. So even a surface scratch can be a zero. Four is severe physical damage, medical hospitalization, not psychiatric. But to circle the right answer here, you need to ask one or two open-ended questions. So if they cut, did it require a Band-Aid or a bandage? Did it bleed a little or profusely? Again, one or two questions to circle the right answer there if there is an attempt. Now, if there is no medical damage, there's one question about potential lethality on the scale, like the gun failing to fire where there was no medical damage. Another example where we would answer potential lethality is if a patient laid on the train tracks with an oncoming train, but they were pulled away before they were run over. 
As soon as they laid on those train tracks, by the way, that became an actual suicide attempt. And both of those would be a two, behavior likely to result in death despite available medical care, right? Because if they had been run over by the train or the gun had not failed to fire, likely they would have died. And it's important to know the difference in severity between two pills and, and trying to shoot oneself in the head. Okay, now on the form it says, if yes, please describe. What's the most important thing to write there or in your chart note or your free text anywhere? What did they do and why did they do it? The pieces of evidence of why you did or didn't call something suicidal and then of course any, any lethality information as well. You always want to make sure to assess ideation and behavior independently. Don't assume if they deny ideation that they won't have behavior. There are people who think they've never had a suicidal thought in their life that will tell you they've made attempts because they don't make the connection. So even if they deny ideation, you must ask about behavior. Time frames. For behavior, the first time you do this, for the lifetime, you capture all lifetime occurrences, the total number of attempts ever, et cetera. But for ideation, we treat it a little bit differently because it would be hard to average a thought across a lifetime. It wouldn't be very representative. So the reference time point for ideation is the time they were feeling the most suicidal. The time in your life you were feeling the most suicidal, did you wish you were dead, et cetera. And, and Beck's work has shown that that reference point is the most significant of, of completed suicide, the biggest, you know, riskiest time period. And the, the scale is really flexible and amenable to whatever the clinical or study need is. So there are screening versions and with different time frames, last week, past month, six months. And what that means is you just change the column header to whatever time frame you are assessing. And then we have something called the since last assessment version, which every time you follow up a patient, you say, what's happened since I last saw you? We also have something called an already enrolled subjects version because this is often being put in the middle of clinical trials or clinical practice because some good data is better than no good data or for safety monitoring. And in those circumstances, the first time a patient gets it, it covers two time periods. Before they came in, like prior to the study start, you know, before you came into the study or into this, into this unit, how many attempts had you made and how about from the study start till now? So that, that covers two time frames. And then, um, as I said, for the since last uh, visit version, you capture all events and types of thoughts since the last assessment. So if you're following somebody, you just say, since I last saw you, what's happened? Okay, we're going to go through some other uh, examples. Several weeks after being informed by her husband he was having an affair, she went to Haiti. She became enraged during their discussion and grabbed his gun with the intention of shooting herself. However, her husband struggled with her, took the gun away before she was able to pull the trigger and hit it from her. She states she was feeling pain and hurt and she was so upset she wanted to die. Any idea of what we'd call that? Interrupted, yeah, exactly. Patient was feeling depressed about her problems. She said she wished that one day she would just die in her sleep and not wake up in the morning. Ideation, and it's that wish to die type, right? That first one. Patient put five pills in his mouth and then spit them out. Aborted, exactly right. Voice commanded the patient, age 18, to jump from the roof. Although he went to the roof, he did not jump. That's aborted also. And, and the issue is that I, I also want to, I, I, I forgot to mention this. People say, well, if it's in the context of psychosis or hallucination, does that count? Well, our definitions, when I say ours, NIMH, Beck's group in Columbia, we all work together on this. If it's psychosis, an auditory hallucination, as long as the content is clearly suicidal, counts as suicidal ideation in our definition of suicidal ideation. Patient was feeling despondent about her financial situation. Her rent was due and the landlord had threatened to evict her. She went to the bathroom and took a razor from the cabinet. She cut one of her wrists and began bleeding. She bandaged up her wrist herself. During an interview a week later, she stated she had never cut herself before. She was adamant she did not need to be hospitalized. Any, any thoughts about this one? It's hard to tell, right? Because 
This, this is another one where there's not enough information because both self-mutilation and suicidality have first-time events, right? So we, again, we just don't know, we know what she did, but we don't know why she did it. Patient experienced heartbreak. She took four clonazepam, called a girlfriend and talked her, cried it out. She was dismissive of its seriousness, but indicated she wanted to die at the time she took the overdose. What would we call that? Attempt, interrupted, or aborted? Attempt, exactly right. As soon as that first pill was ingested, it's what we call an attempt. During pill count, the study staff discovered that six tablets were missing. Upon questioning, the patient admitted she was saving them up so she could take them all together at a later time in order to kill herself. Interrupted, aborted, or preparatory behavior? Preparatory, yeah. The patient reported he first started thinking about killing himself when he was 12. He thought about how easy it would be to pretend to fall in front of a bus before it was able to stop so that it would look like an accident. Although he thought about it often, he said he didn't have the courage to do it. Now that's obviously ideation, but the type of ideation is thoughts with methods. This isn't a plan yet. A plan would be more detailed. A plan is next Tuesday at three o'clock, I'm gonna go into my husband's medicine cabinet when I know he's gonna be away at the office so he can't come home to stop me. A plan is more formulated than this. So one of my final points is that often in settings like this or in clinical trials, we have depression rating scales and they usually have a suicide item in them and we say to ourselves, why isn't that enough? Why do we have to do more? Well, this first one is the PHQ-9. Dr. Spitzer, who developed the DSM, it's his wonderful scale developed in primary care for symptoms of depression. But the suicide item says thoughts that you would be better off dead or of hurting yourself in some way. Well, first of all, we don't even consider better off dead even to be passive suicidal ideation. We don't consider it to be any type of suicidal ideation. So already you set yourself up for false positives. Hurting yourself can be self-mutilation, suicidal behavior. So again, or suicidal ideation, again, you set yourself up for false positives. And we have studies and settings where this item is followed by the SSRS, and that's what we see. When you ask the right questions about suicidality, you do away with cases that should have never been called suicidal in the first place. And, and um, you know, false positives aren't good no matter what setting you're in, in, in our opinion. Now there's a lot of clinical lure in the field that asking these questions is gonna cause somebody to be suicidal, but the data tells us something different than the clinical lure. Dr. Gould, who's an author on the SSRS, has a seminal article in JAMA 2005 indicating that asking these questions does not cause distress or suicidality. Who can administer this scale? You do not need to have specialized mental health training. You just need to have some, some clinical contact and be trained in the appropriate use of the scale. So you can see the different kinds of providers that, that, that can and do use it. How do you use it within a service for screening, for monitoring of outcome and safety as a component of a good risk assessment? In, in basically any way, it's, it has many, many uses and it can be used in all of those different ways. Within a study, it's not just for safety because if an intervention works, suicidality may be reduced. So it's actually nice to have something to document that. And you know, in, in the, it's also used to, um, for inclusion exclusion. In the past, in clinical trials, it used to say acute risk, serious risk, bad risk, and nobody knew what the heck that meant. So this is helping operationalize it a bit better. In clinical trials, it's used across all phases. It's, it's over all types of interventions. We're over 90 languages now for, for all versions of, of this scale. And this actually gives you a bit of a snapshot of where it's being used internationally and clinically. World Health Organization, Europe 100 Best Practices, AMA, Japanese National Institute of Mental Health, Israeli National Suicide Prevention Program, NIAAA, VAs, hospitals, inpatients, outpatients, ERs, general medical, psychiatric, schools, college campuses, et cetera, et cetera. So to us, this is the very good news because what this means, we hope, is that we're all beginning to um, speak the same language a little more, which will hopefully foster more, more precise communication. This also just gives you um, an indication of all the different types of indications where this has been used for quite a while. So across 
every type of psychiatric indication, but you can see uh, pretty much across every type of, of medical and, and, and non-medical issue. It's been used, um, again, for, for quite a while with very good feasibility. So this is my email, and I really um, encourage you to reach out with any questions you have about what to call something, how to give the scale. It's actually on the front of the form of the scale that you have. Um, but really, I, I, we welcome any questions. And let's just go through a few more, a few more cases, OK? Patient described an incident where he definitely wanted to die, couldn't stand being depressed anymore, and decided to hang himself. He tied a telephone cord to the doorknob and placed a cord around his neck. He stopped himself and did not follow through. Aborted, exactly. Ten days prior hospitalization, the, he, the patient ran away from home. He had a bad re report card, came home, had a five to six hour argument with his parents. He put the knife to his wrist and reported never puncturing the skin. Interrupted aborted ideation. Aborted, put the knife to his wrist, didn't follow through, changed his own mind. Okay. So that's the end.